Hi, everyone. Welcome and thank you for being with us. My name is Danielle Lund and I serve as Associate Director of Digital Engagement at the Alumni Association of Mount Holyoke. Our mission is all about providing meaningful opportunities for members of the community to connect. So on that note, before we start our presentation, I want to share with you all that we've just launched a brand new platform. So I'm going to give you view here. It's called The Gates. And it's a space where members of the Mount Holyoke com community can find one another and connect, join affinity groups, and post to community discussion boards. So we encourage everybody to take a look and explore this space. I'm going to drop the URL for it into the, the chat box right now. So it's gates.mtholyoke.edu. So Again, if you, if you want to check out that space, we certainly encourage you to do so. We're about to invite all students in um, in the next week. Getting back to today's event, I want to share that registered for the session are more than 100 community members ranging in class year from the 1950s up through the class of 2024. If you feel comfortable doing so, we certainly encourage you to say a quick hello in the chat, maybe share your class year or your affiliation to Mount Holyoke. It's so great to, to be with you all virtually today. For those who can't join live, we are recording and we'll post to the Alumni Association's website within a few days of the event. And we'd like to just remind that no other recording of the event is permitted without prior written approval. If you don't wish to appear in the recording, please opt just to use the, the chat feature versus raising your hand to vocalize a question. And again, you know, if, a question, if questions arise throughout the event, just drop them in the chat and we'll be doing our best to answer as many as we can throughout and at the end of the, the program. So sharing with us today is Dr. Christine Hartman, an alum of the class of 1987, who currently works for the Department of Veterans Affairs and is on the faculty at UMass Lowell. Christine is gonna be providing insight on the art of crafting effective emails. Uh, so without further ado, thank you for being with us, Dr. Hartman. I'm going to turn things over to you. Danielle, thank you so much. I'm really glad to be here today. And I think you are going to make sure that everyone can see my slides. Is that right? So we're going to have this be as interactive as possible. We have so many great brains in the room today. And I've done these webinars in the past. And I have learned a lot from what people have been saying. and. I just want to encourage all of you to participate because the more you participate, the more you will learn. And also there's an altruistic component because as you are participating, everybody's going to be able to see your answers. And so we can all learn from what, what you have to say. There we go. Excellent. Great. So this question here on the screen is about what makes email ineffective. And I'm concentrating initially on what makes email ineffective because we can learn so much about where things have gone wrong. And the point of today is really to focus on how your own emails can become more powerful, more effective means of communication. I'm going to be sharing some excellent emails that are great examples of what you can do in an email. And I'm also going to be sharing some examples of emails that were Let's just be honest about it. They were not so excellent. As we move forward in this, as I said before, we're going to try to make this as interactive as possible. And we're going to have two ways of doing that. We're going to have polls that Danielle is going to be running behind the scenes. And if you don't have a way to jot down some notes right in front of you, this might be a time to just grab pen and paper or open a separate Word document on your screen that you can get to quickly because some of the interaction is going to happen through the chat box. And if you have a Word document, you can cut and paste into the chat. If you want to just write something down and then put it in the chat, we're going to use that chat mechanism to communicate with each other because I'm going to have some questions on the screen. And that's where your learning and participation partly is going to take place. So to start us off, I'd like to just voice the obvious. We know this, and I'm, make, I'm making it explicit here. Email is a limited form of communication. So right now, you can hear my tone of voice. You can see my face. In email, you can't do any of that. You're limited to words and the organization of those words. And that is limiting in some ways, but it's also powerful. So don't be 
afraid of using the power of that email to its maximum because there's so much an email can do despite not having the power of a face or the tone of voice behind it. I'd also like, you all know this, it's something my mother taught me decades ago and it's still true today, never write an email that you won't, wouldn't want to see published in a newspaper, right? We've all had this experience. We've all seen emails published in newspapers and I know just last week I sent an email to someone who wasn't the intended recipient because the two box populated with a similar name and I just hit send because I was in a rush. So that can happen. People can forward your email. Be careful about what you put in an email. We all know this. I just want to be really explicit about it. What we're going to dive into is the is the formatting and the, I would say, not quite secret, but the tips for how you can apply certain basic principles to make your own emails more powerful. And I did a lot of research for this that I'm really excited to share. And I'll say that some of that research comes through marketing and I am not a marketing professional. So if any of you is a marketing professional, and I get something terribly wrong, please call me out in the chat. And speaking of the chat, let's make sure we use that here for this interactive activity. Danielle is gonna help me behind the scenes and tell me what's happening in the chat box because I can't see it right now. But you all have reasons that you do not reply or even open an email. What are those reasons? I know there's gonna be some overlap, but tell me in your own life, when you get an email and you're like, ah, I don't have time to open or whatever it is. It might not be time. I don't, I'm not opening that email or I'm not replying to that email right now. What are the reasons that you're doing that? Danielle, can you share what's coming through in the chat box? Absolutely. So I see too many emails, um, junk or distraction, a bad subject line. Um, let's see, overwhelmed by the volume of emails, too long, volume, again, volume of emails. So it seems yeah. like that, that's an issue. Again, the length of emails, it's not a priority. Um, something from a difficult person, the sender, uh, a subject may not be interesting, or I think there's a lot of work in replying, too much info in one email, I'm too busy, an angry customer, unclear subject, too salesy sounding. So, okay, great. 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 wow, that, that covered a lot of ground. So I heard things like, like too many emails, meaning that you just don't have time to respond to all of those emails. The email itself isn't appealing because it's too long or the subject isn't clear or the subject line isn't making it appealing for you to respond. Also in terms of the person who's sending the email. So we can't change who you are, but we can change how you appear in an email. So what I'm gonna talk about today, these aren't rules. There are no hard and fast rules about how to write an email. But there are principles that you can apply. So the question, can I do this in an email? Can I not, should I not do that in an email? The answer is you can do just about anything you want in an email. The real question to ask yourself is why? Why are you doing the things that you are doing? Why are you applying that principle? Or if you choose not to apply the principle because you're going to think because you think that email is going to be more powerful without applying that principle, why are you doing it? As long as you understand your own motivations for why you are doing certain things, then that is what is going to drive what you apply from what you learn. For example, today. So this is a stylized avatar I often use in my presentations, but Today, I really feel like I want to introduce you to my friends instead. So this is Lilia. She's actually my best friend when I went to Mount Holyoke. She's a Mount Holyoke class grad. This is Raul and River and Yumi and Patsy, and they're going to help me give my presentation today. Daniel, can you launch the first poll, please? Absolutely. So here we go. All right, poll is up. Great. So if everyone could just answer what the, they think the most important feature of an effective email is. So we have about 65%, 70% people voted. You can come in. I love this interaction. This is really great. Thanks all of you. Awesome. Yep, up to about 90, 93%. Yeah, maybe, maybe that's good enough. All right, cool. So are you, um, 
Christine, I'm not sure if you're seeing the, the poll results. Yep, I'm seeing them. So it's really excellent. The main point for your audience up front, that got the most responses. But what I'm really happy to see, and, and Danielle, you can close that down, is that all of the answer choices had people who chose them. Um, so the poll itself was designed as a primer for the content that I'm going to cover today. So that's why I'm happy to see that every, every answer choice had at least some people choosing that content. And it was great that number two and number four had fewer people choose them because it gives me a lot of room to convince all of you that those are really important. And I was also really happy to see number three get the most answers because that's what I'm launching into next. So what you need to think about, one of the most important things when you're writing an email is to think about who is getting the email. We write that email so it's sometimes easy, I find myself doing this, to take my own perspective when I'm writing an email. But the perspective you need to take when you write an email, of course, is the person who's going to read that email. And what you don't want is what's happening to Raul here. Where the heck is the main point in this email? Some of you mentioned that actually in that first uh, interactive question in the chat box. So when you think about your main point, this may not be the first question that comes to mind, but it's one I encourage you to think about who your target audience is. Is it your friend? Is it your boss? Is it a thousand people you've never met before? Who's your target audience? And then what is your desired outcome for that email? Every email has a point to it, hopefully. And if you think about that desired outcome, that is the, helps you then put it together with your target audience, helps you get to your main point. Because your main point is really about getting that target audience to do what you want them to do. So how do you do that? How do you match your audience with your outcome? So it's really helpful to get some understanding of what kind of emails your audience, your target audience normally gets. So if it's people you know, you might have some idea. Are these people who are sitting at a desk all day and they get kind of long emails because that's the kind of thing that they get with their job? Or are they people who are reading emails quickly and they get a lot of short emails. So I know in my job, I interact with a lot of doctors, doctors who are, who are doing clinical work, they don't have time to read long emails. Their email of choice is usually, the ones that they answer are usually these very short to the point, no hi, you know, hi Dr. So-and-so or hi whatever. They just want that one sentence, two sentence and get that email out of the way. So have a good understanding of what kind of emails your audience normally gets and get an understanding of how they normally read those emails, if you can. So I know again, sometimes you can't and you might just have to extrapolate from your own email experience or that of your friends or your colleagues. But you can often, if it's people you interact with a lot, have a sense, are they reading their emails uh, during the day, are they reading them at their desktop? And then after hours, they're reading them on their smartphone. They're out on a job site all the time, so they're always reading on their smartphone. It helps to have a sense of that too, because then you can use your own email composing skills to target that email content and how you present it to get them to get to your desired outcome. Another thing you want to keep in mind is what kind of email you're writing. So there are two basic kinds of emails. And this first one is a call to action email. That's a marketing term. So a call to action is basically an email where you're calling that, out that person to act. So you want them to do something when they get your email. That's contrasted with a different type of email, which is an informational email. This is the kind of email where you want them to gain some sort of knowledge because of the email that you're writing. And you see that down in the bottom right hand, the corner there's a hyperlink so this is a hyperlink to a site where you could get more information and at the end of this presentation you can email Danielle she'll put the information in the chat box and you can get a PDF of these slides and then that in that PDF the hyperlink will be active uh, and you can get some more information there I'll have these throughout in the bottom right hand corner of the presentation so you know where to go to get some more information this slide is potentially, if you remember nothing else from this presentation, I encourage you to remember this principle, 
the 132 principle. If you're not familiar with it, the 132 principle basically means that the least important piece of information should come in the middle, sandwiched between the first and the last pieces of information, which should be your most important piece of information and your second most important piece of information. Now, sometimes, you know, they're principles, they're not rules. Sometimes you want to flip that and have it be the 231 principle. That's fine as long as you know why you're doing it. The most important thing to remember is that our brains remember in this order. So we remember first experiences and last experiences. We tend to forget what's in the middle. And this is from science. We know that that's how people's brains work. Whether or not you're remembering your colonoscopy or a birthday party, you will remember the first experience and the last experience that you had in that event more than you will what's in the middle. And an experience also is the experience of reading an email. So it's important to follow 132 principle at the level of everything in that email, at the level of a sentence. The sentence itself can put the most important piece of information first and the second most important last and then sandwich the rest of the stuff in the middle, the paragraph level, the email level. If you're writing things other than email, if you're writing papers, if you're writing newspaper articles, following the 132 principle is a really powerful tool that will help people remember your emails. And there's a way to know when you're not following it. So let me tell you, the first draft of an email that I'm writing isn't necessarily following the 132 principle, even though I think it's a really important thing that I like to apply to just about everything. It's not what naturally comes to me. Sometimes I need to reorganize my email and that's fine. And one of the clues that you can pick up on for your own writing is whether or not you have this desire to bold or highlight or in other ways call out something that's in the middle of your sentence, your paragraph, your paper. That's a clue that you're putting important information somewhere that it shouldn't be. It should not be in the middle. It should be up front or at the end. You are not supposed to be able to read this email, but you can see that there's some bolding in this email. This is actually two or three paragraphs into an email that I received. And the first couple of paragraphs were what I would call fluff. You know, how you doing? Life is really busy these days, da, da, da. Then they got to the main point. They put this main point here and they bolded it and it came at the beginning of the paragraph. That's terrific. That's exactly what the 132 principle says. It should come right there. But look where else they put some bolding. Now this is, this could easily be me under certain circumstances, but, and it, and it might be you, but now those of us who know the 132 principle would take the time to reorganize this because let me tell you, just because you bolded it doesn't mean that people are going to read it and it doesn't mean that they're going to remember it. Take the time to draft an email and if you see things like this in your own emails, reorganize so this information comes at the beginning of paragraphs because that's what people are going to remember. So you guessed it, we're going to do a little interactive exercise right now. Imagine that you are writing a call to action email. I don't care what the subject is. Whatever subject you would like it to be, just it could be an email that you've written recently, a subject that comes up at work, something you're doing for fun, or just use your imagination. But think about a call to action, an email where you want to get somebody to do something and think of a first sentence that is following that 132 principle, putting the most important piece of information up front in that email. And Danielle, I'm gonna hand it over to you and see whether people are putting things in the chat box. Yep, do you have time for a brief conversation? Make a gift to the Mount Holyoke Fund today. I wanted to make you aware of an exciting opportunity that I think you'd be a great fit for. I need your help, is what I'm saying. Uh, get native plants for your garden. Let me know how I can help you save money in college. Oh, I like that. That's a great. <laughs> I was very interested in your paper and would love to have a Zoom call sometime. Looking forward to seeing you at the event on Thursday evening. Hi, X. I hope this message finds you well, is how I usually start with but I feel rude otherwise. Um, join us on Wednesday at 7 p.m. Eastern for an interactive online update of college admissions tools. Uh, I, so Danielle, thank you. And I'm sure there are a whole bunch more. 
And those are really excellent because you guys are getting to the main point right away. I know that I, I think there was somebody who said, hi, I hope this email finds you well. I know that I, to this day, I probably today, I wrote an email that started off with something similar to that. And then I took the time to move that in the, in the email so that that first sentence hits with your main point what do you want them to do? Why are you sending this email? Even eliminating things like, I'm sending this email today to tell you that, you can cut all that out and just say, boom, what it is that you want them to do. So thank you so much for thinking that through. Um, that was that was a really great, and I love that all of you are thinking about Mount Holyoke as well as you write those. So let's move that 132 principle and apply it a little bit more broadly and think about conceptually organizing your content so that you, when you write these emails, are like, Patsy, I know you read that and you know that people read that content because you have conceptually organized it. So as we just said in some of those examples, putting that main point, that hook, right up front, even before, even though it's tempting to write something about background information or to be cordial and say something um, that you think might engage somebody, what really engages people is knowing why the heck they're getting that email. So make sure your first paragraph contains that main point that you want to make. And when I prep for writing an email, here are some steps that I go through. So understand that target audience we've already talked about, but then listing out those points, whether you list it in your draft email or whether you're just listing the main points that you want to make in your head. And then if you have more than one point to make, let's say you have six points you want to make, you need to think about whether that should really go in one email or whether this is the time to break this up and send multiple emails. One thing you might want to consider is instead of pounding people with a whole bunch of asks or information in one email, when they reply to you, they've already engaged with you and then you can hit them with a whole bunch of other things. If you can figure out what that one main thing is that you would want them to get, to, that you want them to do. So leading with that main point is so important and I'm gonna make you feel that by feeling some of my pain. So in my career, I actually write papers for scientific journals. That's, what, that's part of what I do. And when you write papers for scientific journals, you send them to the journal and it goes through a two-step process. It goes first to the editor of the journal and the editor makes an assessment based on your summary about whether that paper fits the journal scope and topic, and whether it's high quality and enough to get to that journal. And if you get past that first phase, they send it out to other people to look at. So the, if you get rejected at that first phase, it's called a desk reject because you get rejected from the desk of the editor. It never gets any farther than that. It doesn't go any further. So that process of desk reject is what we're going to talk about because I'm going to show you examples of two emails that I really got from two real journals with desk rejects in them. Now you know they are desk rejects, but as you read these emails, pretend you're me. I didn't know they were rejects when I got the email, so that was my main interest in reading that email and that was actually also the journal's main point. They wanted to tell me accept or reject. So look at this first example, take a second to read it, and tell me where you see that key piece of information, that main point that both the journal wanted to convey to me and I wanted to know. Pretend you're me and you wanna know this too. So yeah, you're still reading because it doesn't come till the bottom of the third paragraph. Here is where they finally told me that this was a rejection, right? So if you were like me, because this was the most important piece of information and you were looking for it, you probably skimmed the rest of this information and you certainly didn't really take it in because you still didn't have that main point. So this was a real journal that sent me this real example. I'm gonna show you another example. Let's read this one. Okay, much quicker, right? You found it right there in the second sentence of the first paragraph. Main point up front. 
So this was the main point. And let me tell you that when I got this email, I was much more likely, not much more likely, I read the rest of that email because I wanted to understand why they rejected me. Unlike that first email where I skimmed everything because they didn't give me that main point up front, you can tell that when you put the main point up front, people are actually much more engaged in your email content and they're much more likely to continue to read the rest of it because you've given them the reason to read the rest of it by putting your main point up front. So there were intelligent people behind both of these emails. I certainly argue that example two is a better format and a more powerful and effective format for an email. Now, another way to conceptually organize your content is to use the PS. Now, I don't know if many of you are thinking about how you can use a PS, but the data actually show that people are likely to read PSs sometimes more than the rest of the email. And it boosts conversion rates. This is another marketing term. A conversion rate is when you convert someone who didn't, who wasn't a previous buyer of your project product into a buyer of your product. So in your case, your product is either getting them to do what you want them to do or getting them to understand and know what it is you want them to know. So boosting conversion rates is something you'd really like to do. And so strategic use of a PS is important to at least keep in your toolbox of things to do. Now, keep in mind that if your email is super long and somebody's scrolling, 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 scrolling before they get to the PS, it's not gonna be effective. But if you have a reasonably short email where they have a, an ability to see that PS relatively soon, that PS may be something you wanna consider using and keep that PS short no more than one line now i know that on a you know large desktop monitor and on a smartphone one line look different but basically the message is keep that ps short and here are the some of the things that you can use that ps for so that you can hammer home a message if it's a call to action get them to do what it is you want them to do in that email Danielle, could you launch the second poll now, please? Absolutely. And I'll just know a couple of people uh, had the observation, maybe they were trying to sort of soften if it's a rejection email, uh, kind of soften that, that type of situation. Um, yes. So I agree. That's probably why they did that. But it led to not digesting the information that they put first. And... I have to tell you, when, when you're the recipient of that type of email, so it always, um, it always pays to keep in mind your intended audience and how they will receive your email. So when you are receiving an email, let's say you want to get into Mount Holyoke, and let's say Mount Holyoke then sends you an email where that information isn't until the bottom of the third paragraph. I don't know that that's softening or creating more anxiety and annoyance on the part of the recipient because they have to sift through a lot of information that they think, oh, maybe now they're going to tell me whether I got in. Maybe now they're going to tell me whether I got in. It's much easier on the recipient side to get that main information on front. So I agree completely with the people who made those comments, completely. I think that's exactly why those journals did it that way. And I think it's much more kind and powerful to put that main point up front. Thanks for expounding on that. So I'm going to go ahead and launch this poll. Great. So would everybody please respond about how often you think, just be honest, we don't know who you are, you think about the visual appearance of your emails, how they actually look. Not, not what they say, but just how do they look to you? How often do you think about that? Oh, that's great. So we've got like 80% of the people chiming in here. That's terrific. So I am really glad that a lot of you are frequently or sometimes thinking about it. And some of you are always thinking about it. And then there's some of you who rarely or never think about it. And that is, um, uh, I think, a very typical set of responses that there are a lot of people who sometimes do it, to varying degrees, and then there are others who really don't spend a lot of time thinking about the visual content. So Lilia and I are going to make this point together that beauty actually matters, and the science backs us up. So 
What does science say? When you think about visually organized content, you can Google later words that are uh, phrases that are cognitive ease and cognitive strain. So there's a lot of research on cognitive ease and cognitive strain when it has to do with how words look on a page. And if you've ever taken a survey, uh, people are thinking about cognitive ease and cognitive strain when they put surveys together. Cognitive ease scientifically shown is scientifically shown to when you feel cognitive ease, meaning something is very easy to read, it makes you more likely to agree with the person who uh, wrote the content, right? You're more likely to agree with the content. So in our case, since that email was written by you, the person is more likely to agree with you. When, when somebody is strained cognitively by how the, co the content appears visually, then they are more likely to be critical of the content that they are reading. So just from that, that makes a really strong argument for always keeping in mind how your email content looks. So in terms of visually organizing content, there are a number of things that you can keep in mind when you think about that. So one of the things you can keep in mind is thinking about white space. White space is, a, is the space here on this slide. For in terms of cognitive ease, white space makes things easier to read. If you think about an email that you got, and I think some people mentioned this right at the beginning, that the email was too dense. There was just too much. If you break your email up with some white space, it can cause, it can create cognitive ease in the mind of your reviewer, and it's actually easier for them to read that email. Another thing to do is to break things up using headers. And now you might not think of headers in emails, but actually a lot of emails benefit from having headers, just bolded words to organize the content for the reader. Again, it promotes cognitive ease. And then bulleted lists. I find myself doing this all the time these days, taking what is first in my first draft a paragraph and realizing that that paragraph is really just a list. And instead of having by the one, three, two principle, some of that list being buried in the middle and people then not acting on it or not seeing it or not remembering it, I break it out into numbers or bullets. And that way each bullet is is a point in itself and it's a lot easier for people to remember and to take in rather than a bunch of dense texts. If you have the opportunity to include hyperlinks to content that's elsewhere so that you can shorten your own email, that's really great to do. And you can call out lots of important things in your email using bolding and otherwise other ways of highlighting now, we've talked about you don't want to do that if it's in the middle because then it's a clue that you're not organizing via the 132 principle. And I'm about to show you an email where somebody really went overboard in terms of trying to do some of this. So do it judiciously. And then, of course, if you're sending out an email to large groups of people, you want to test on the different devices that they might take a look at your email on. So yeah, now this is a real email. A colleague of mine sent this to me because she got this in her inbox. And, you know, the person who wrote this email probably spent about half an hour figuring out all the different colors and what they all meant. But the thing is, those colors only mean something to the person who wrote the email because no matter how much I read this email, I could not figure out what that color scheme was trying to say. You will also see that this entire email is written in bold. Now, None of you is going to write an email like this, but it's it's a little bit of description of how doing everything judiciously can actually be effective, whereas overboard can be extremely ineffective. And while we're on the ineffective, let's look at the subject line. If you're like me, you only understand one word in the subject line changes, right? I don't understand what the rest. I don't even know what r slash t means. So if you are writing an email, some people mentioned this at the beginning also, make sure that subject line makes sense not to you as the writer, but to the reader, because your target audience is the person you're trying to move with your email. It makes no sense for your email subject line to make sense only to you. Now, this is also a real email. I shortened it somewhat just to get a screenshot, but all the main content was here. And again, you're not supposed to be able to read this, but you can see that the main point comes up here right up front in a larger font 
and then with a line separating it from the rest of the content, really nicely done. They have active use of white space here. You can just skim this email with your eyes and think, oh, this isn't going to be a hard email to, to read. It uses headers, it has hyperlinks in it so the content can remain really short, and right at the bottom of the email, there's a call to action that's really clear. If you want more information, click here. So this is an example of a really nicely visually organized email. Now, not all of our emails are going to look like this. This is a, an email that went out to a lot of people, and you're not going to take the time to put together an email like this for your boss, but it highlights the importance of visual organization in terms of making an email extremely effective. Now we did talk a little bit about subject line. Let's dive a little deeper into subject line because what we don't want is what's happening to Yumi here where Yumi's like, what? I don't understand that subject line at all. And so I, some of you said this in the beginning, you don't understand the subject line, you're not gonna open that email. So again, it helps us here to think like a marketing professional and research has shown that people do respond to judicious use of words like important. If you add that to your subject line, people are more likely to open that email. People also really like to be thanked. So if you have the opportunity, if that email is all about thanking people, definitely put that in your subject line. There are also some other things that you might think would be effective that are actually less effective. So if somebody doesn't know about your event, they are likely to open that email. But if you're reminding them about the event or canceling the event, they're likely not to open that email or they're less likely to open that email. And even though we all wanna say, this is your last chance, it is something that is actually going to result in fewer openings for an email. So you can definitely Google a lot about what makes an effective subject line because this is what a lot of marketers have spent a lot of time collecting data about. One of the things that they've also researched is how long your subject line should be. And I think somebody mentioned this at the beginning as well. If you have a really long subject line, people are not going to open your email. They're going to be much less likely to open your email. If your subject line is seven words or fewer, they are much more likely to open. And the difference between seven and eight words is astounding. So if you can count, I know it seems kind of strange, but actually these days when I write subject lines, I count. I just do a quick count. How many words do I have in that subject line? If it's seven, if it's more than seven words, I cut it down trying to keep this short so that people will be much more likely to open the email. Now, short also means that you are on topic. You know what your main point is because you've done all the thinking about who your audience is, what kind of emails they normally get, what your main point is. And so make that subject line really clear and really short and you will boost the opening rate of your emails. So let's talk about subject lines. Think about an email that you recently sent. It may not have had the most effective subject line or think about an imaginary email that you would like to send. Create a seven word or fewer subject line for that email that draws people in, that hooks them, that gives them the information they need to know and makes them want to open that email to learn more. So Danielle, when we start getting some answers in the chat box, I know this might take people a couple of seconds to come up with a really effective subject line, but when we start to get some coming in, will you share them with us? Sure thing. And while people are um, starting to add their answers, we had a question, are sans serif typefaces preferred in an email since they're easier to read on computer? Any, any thoughts about typeface? Um, so, uh, so Danielle, I am having just a little bit trouble hearing you if you could speak just a little bit more loudly, but I think what I heard was a, a question about the font and whether, for example, sans serif fonts are better. So in terms of, um, and you can see this entire presentation is in a sans serif font, in terms of serif versus sans serif, uh, it, the answer is pretty clear in terms of how, uh, how computers and how marketers uh, 
uh, the research that they have done that sans serif fonts are better. They are more accepted by all kinds of programs. And in terms of accessibility for people who have visual impairments, sans serif fonts are also shown to be better. So I default always to sans serif, even though my word program defaults to Times New Roman. When I get a new computer, I immediately change that and it defaults to Arial. So I do the same thing in my email, which happens to default to Calibri, which is a sans serif font. Awesome. Thank you so much. Can you hear me now? Yep, I can hear okay. you a little better. Thank Great. you. So we are, we're getting some responses come through. So I see, join me for an, a, a museum event, question mark. Financial aid essentials for juniors, support the Mount Holyoke Fund, um, popular tonight, popular subject. Uh, could you, uh, let me see. Um, next week's leadership team meeting, you won't believe the Saltwatch recording requesting extension of, of quote validity, program begins tomorrow. Um, let's see, sign up for COVID vaccine now, payment came through and now next steps. Um, money and internship experience with cookies. <laughs> Always a draw. That's great. Those are really great. I'd like to thank everybody. I'm really impressed with those. Those are really short and completely on target, right to the point of that email. People know exactly what the content of that email is gonna be from those subject lines. I'm really impressed with how you've man managed to pull all those together into something that is really short, because I know for myself, my first subject line isn't always the shortest and it takes a while to get a subject line to be exactly what I want it to be. And I know it maybe feels like I'm spending a lot of time on email, uh, in my life, which I do spend a lot of time on email, but I'm, I also find that it's become my little challenge to try to get my emails to format and have the content be as good as I can get. And that is a continual learning process. It's like I'm learning tennis or something. There's always something you can do a little bit better. So I, I find that making that email challenge one of the things that I do every day, it makes my email life a little bit more interesting. So the last thing I'll say, we've talked about it a lot, is about keeping things short. Brevity is so important. And if you don't understand what River's saying here, it's TLDR stands for too long, didn't read. And I, and I remember clearly that some of you said, whoa, email was too long, couldn't get through it. And that is a real problem. So that's a problem that you all know as recipients of emails, but as writers of emails, we tend to think, and I, I fall into this camp as well, I'm guilty as charged. I sometimes write an email where I think, well, but this is important and I'd really like them to know this also. And then all of a sudden my email gets really long. It's, it's uh, the data show that if you send a long rambly email, which that may be the first kind of email that I put down on the page as the draft, a long rambly email is actually gonna get less of a response than a short to the point email. And we're gonna show you, I'm gonna show you how to write a really short email that is really to the point. One of the tips is to keep your ask to one per email. Now I asked you a while ago to think about, look, when you're writing down your main points, do you have one main point? Do you have six main points? Is there any way you can break that up if you have six main points? Do you really need to put all six in that one email? It gets a better response if you have one point per email. If you keep images that you're gonna use in your email to three or fewer and that you keep the entire email to 20 lines of text or fewer. Now, this isn't gonna happen all the time. Sometimes you need to write a longer email and that's perfectly appropriate. Remember we said in the beginning, these are principles and all you need to know is why you are applying them or why you are not applying them. So this doesn't always apply, but if you are really trying to hammer home and trying to get something done or somebody to read something, keeping it shorter is better. And here is a way to write a five sentence email that might even be as short as two sentences, because as you see, some of this stuff is if needed, if they know who you are, you don't need to include who you are. I don't include that to people who know me. And it, the email itself could be as short as what you want and what the action step is. That's a two sentence email. So by now you guess what's coming next. I'm gonna ask you to write a maximum three sentence email. 
is I copied those tips from the prior page right here into this box that you see on the screen. Write a three sentence email or fewer, get it down to two sentences if you can, to get somebody to do something. So remember to hit them with why they, what you want them to do and then what their action step is. And then if you need to, why you're asking that, why they should do it. So choose among those no longer than three sentences. And I know this is going to take you a little while. So I actually have some Jeopardy music queued up. So Danielle, I'm going to play this while we're letting these wonderful people here write their answers into the chat box, first composing that email. Sounds good. becomes an earworm for everyone. <laughs> uh, all right. Oh, we have a few now. So let's start. Um, Dear X, my name is Lori Burrell, and I'm an Associate Dean for Special Collections at the University of Arkansas. I'm hoping we can find a time to talk about how the libraries can help to document and preserve your legacy in our community. Can we set up a time to talk by phone or Zoom in the coming weeks? Thanks. Great. And then, hi, Tim, do you want to cancel your newsletters for this month? The queue is, uh, is a disaster this week, and it's going to be hard for me to get them out in a reasonable time. Let me know what you want to do about this. Okay, excellent. Ending right with what, what they should do to answer. I'm a concerned citizen who wants to protect our democracy. Our right to vote is at stake, and if we don't exercise our right to vote, we could lose it. Please go and register to vote if you have not. <laughs> excellent. Very timely topic. Uh, please review the attached list of potential donors and let me know uh, and let me know who you know. I am asking for this so we can focus our resources on the most likely do donor prospects. Please check off the names on the list and email it back to me at your earliest convenience. Okay, great. That that was you know important points up front and last. Very nice. Uh, let's see. Hi, legal person. Um, customer has asked us for draft language for the contract writer. We have a chance to shape the language in our favor. Do you have a few minutes to review my draft? Okay, terrific. So you all really get the hang of this. And, and the thing to remember is that while a three sentence email may seem like a really short email, what those emails that Daniel just read out, and Daniel, thank you so much for doing that, just read out show that it's possible to get emails down to just what you need them to say. And when it's really important, or this is an impression that you want to make on someone, or you just definitely need somebody to do something and get back to you, the shorter the email is, the data show, the more likely it is that they will read it and respond to it. So if you put everything together, you're going to have may not be the perfect email, but you can work on always getting those emails to be just a little bit better. So today we've covered a whole bunch of stuff uh, and I have them it all summarized here on this slide. If you get that PDF from Danielle, then you can print this out and remind yourself of things. Just always keeping the main point up front, following that one, three, two principle and conceptually organizing your content, visually organizing your content have your subject line be as short and compelling as possible. And then in general, just keeping your email as brief as possible. Now, emails also include a lot of writing and we didn't really talk about writing or content. I did some previous webinars with the Department of Veterans Affairs where I work and they are archived and free and publicly available. So again, if you get the PDF copy of these slides, these hyperlinks will be there. There are sessions on writing and editing your own writing, which you might find helpful when you're putting together emails. So please take a look at those. There are also a ton of resources available on Google. 
And I have a website if you're interested in learning more about writing and editing. And then in specifically, this is geared somewhat toward academics and people in science for writing papers and writing grant proposals. It's writebetterproposals.org. And all of this is also free. I have a lot of posts here. I think they're over 50. And I come out with other posts every couple of weeks if you want to sign up for those. So Danielle, thank you. I'm ready to take questions. Yumi, River, Patsy, Raul, Lilia are all here to take questions with me. And if you want to email me directly, this is my email at the bottom of the screen. It's Christine underscore Hartman at uml.edu. UML stands for University of Massachusetts Lowell. And just remember that Hartman has two N's on it if you want the email to get to me. So Danielle, any questions? Awesome. So I'm going to be keeping my eye on the chat box. So I've dropped into the chat our programs team email. If you are interested in reaching out to acquire this, the slides from the day, by all means, shoot us a note and I'll send you those, those your way. Um, I'm also going to quickly drop in the chat. Uh, you know, if folks are thinking of questions, feel free to put those in there and we'll uh, raise them. So here we go. Do you have any comments regarding tone? What do you examine as a means to ensure that your tone sounds appropriate? Right, so tone is tricky, right? You're, you're dealing with words and organization only. So one of the things that I think about is that the organization of the email partly reflects the tone. So, um, so I do spend time thinking about the organization and the visual appearance of that email because I find that it, it reflects a respectful tone if that content is organized. It meant that I took the time to think about how I put that email together. And that in and of itself conveys a sense of respect for the reader. In terms of tone, in terms of language, I think, I think there's a lot that could be said about that. It is, I believe, uh, a clue to tone is often in the emails that the other person sends to you. So it, I often mimic the tone of the email of the person who has written to me. So if I have some sort of correspondence with that person and that person tends to write short emails, they don't put a lot of um, attention to how they may sound, uh, but, but they're really to the point, then I try to keep my emails also correspondingly short to the point. Whereas if I get an email from someone who really spends a lot of time with a lot of fluff at the beginning and end of the email, I tend to mimic that because, you know, most people aren't thinking about this in the way that we just went through thinking about it. They're just whipping off emails and the emails are designed for themselves, not for the reader. And so I find that people's emails tell you a lot about who they are. And if you mimic their tone, I think that's a first step in making sure that they, those are the types of emails. Now, this, of course, is assuming that they're not sending an email that's yelling at you or something, but it just in the general email correspondence, it's always nice for people to get reflected back what they have put out there to you. Any advice on um, following up on something you already asked the person to do? Yes, um, so I often use the word nudge or tickle and I use, I use those words um, carefully depending on who the person is, but uh, I also sometimes preface it with, I know you are very busy, but I'm just bumping this to the top of your inbox, for example. Um, it's just a one line. Uh, I'm just, uh, you know, sorry to nudge you, but I'm bumping this to the top of your inbox. Um, something like that, that is just one sentence, not really going into a lot of detail because they know. And I, I found that to be effective, even if I have to do it a number of times. Um, it, that helps also sometimes I paste the content of that email back into the top of the email so they don't have to scroll back down through the whole thing. Or I say see yellow highlight below so they know exactly what that call to action was, what it was that I wanted them to do, for example. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Christine. Yeah. Uh, I don't see all questions at the moment. Uh, I'm going to, again, just quickly drop into the chat box just in case case folks need quick access, the, um, the links uh, to my email, to the association main page where you can find the recording of this event uh, and our upcoming events, and then also to access our new connections platform, the Gates 
you might want to connect in there. It's a great, great space to, you know, join groups of similar interests where you can pose questions on a community discussion board. So we encourage everybody to take a look. And with that said, Christine, thank you again so much um, for sharing with us today. Uh, I've really enjoyed the interactive presentation um, and we're wishing everybody a, a great night. Yeah, thank you so much for this opportunity. It was really fun. Thanks everybody for participating. That's what always makes these webinars is to get the sense that we're all in the room together. So I really appreciate everybody and your great emails and subject lines that you put together. Thank you so much, Mount Holyoke, for the opportunity. And um, I look forward to connecting with all of you on the gates because uh, that's something I plan to do this weekend is sign up. Awesome. All right. That's and that's where we'll 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 call it a webinar. <laughs> Have, wishing everybody well. Bye Thank now. Thank you. Bye-bye.